we're back again. This time, we're good old Mel from Sneakers Corner, my good friend uh, there uh, in Europe, who has been working, striving, trying to find out what we're gonna, where are we gonna place Islam in the seventh century. Back in the seventh century, we're always talking about that. Thinks that we may solve this problem concerning Mecca, the city Mecca. Now you've all been told that Mecca is down in, well, Hijaz, the central part of Arabia. And you've always been told this because you have been listening to the traditions, the ninth and 10th century traditions. And that's the only place they, they have get a place. If that's the only narrative you've ever heard, uh, it's the only place that you've ever thought of, which is fascinating because when you look in the Quran and you, and you look and see where this place is mentioned in the Quran, it's only mentioned to one place in chapter 48, verse 24. And it, he it is who has withheld their hands from you and your hands from them in the midst of Mecca after he had made you victors over them. Allah is the ever all seer of what you do. That's it. That's the only place, one place in the entire Quran where this word is found. If it's such a, it, <laughs> an important place, and it is. It's uh, the place where Adam and Eve were sent to in chapter 7, uh, verse 24, when they were thrown out of the Garden of Eden, they're up in space. It is the place, supposedly, in chapter 21, verse 51 to 71, where Abraham is rebuilding, uh, not rebuilding, destroying the idols there in the Kaaba. According to all the traditions in the 9th and 10th century, out of sight of the Quran, it is where all the trade went, north, south, east, and west. And we have the trade route theory from the Dr. Montgomery uh, Watt in the early 20th century, who talks about the fact that all the trade had to be redirected towards, uh, through Mecca, coming down from Aden up to Gaza in, in the north, had to be redirected because of the wars between the Byzantines and the Sassanids. So nobody has ever disputed this, and no one has ever really wanted to dispute it, because why would you dispute it, since that's the only narrative you're permitted? That's the only narrative that is taught, that's the only narrative that I grew up with. Well, Mel thinks differently, and Mel wants to look and find out what exactly we can find in the seventh century. Remember, we're always going back to the seventh century. We don't trust the Quran. We don't trust al Buhari. We don't trust Ibn Hisham and all these other names. We don't trust any of these people because they are so late and they're so far away. So as a good historian, what Mel always does, and I love this about Mel and Murad, they always go back to that which takes place or that which we can find in the time period that all of these events were happening in the seventh and the eighth century. So Mel, I invited you back. Good are you, are you still there? I am indeed, I'm great to be back, Jay. And, Good on uh, you. Yeah, I think the, the key question that's been asked again and again is where did it all start? Where was the original Mecca? And obviously there's a huge debate about that. But another related question is, what is the explanation for why it ended up being where it is way down south in the Hejaz? So looking at the early sources, what I've come to the conclusion is that we have a lot of assumptions that come from much later, which are bundled together. And if we can detach ourselves from all the theories, from all the later assumptions, and this go back to what is the earliest evidence, I think what you discover is there's a totally different uh, way of explaining everything. And today is an attempt to explain that just based on the early evidence. So I'm throwing away all my previous theories, all my previous assumptions, and I'm just working up from the ground up from the earliest sources. Okay. Now, of course, for, for people, maybe some people are saying, what are we talking about? What do we mean by Mecca? Is it the city, the city itself, does it have a meaning? Does it, do you know if it has any meaning, significance, any etymological reference point? Yeah. Um, one, um, theory that I heard is that it means something like lowland, um, but okay. I'm not. I'm not a linguist. I don't know, and I'm sure there are linguists out there who can come up with explanations for its meaning. Obviously, a key element to that would be what language was that word in originally. That's going to be a factor in its etymology. Was it an Aramaic word? Was it an Arabic word? That's key. Um, we're not going to try. We're not going to undig that, and we're not going to try to dig that up and try to find the meaning for that in this talk here. I, I, I remember yeah. that Dan Gibson refers to this, and he says, "Listen, when you look at the Quran, it always talks about the Masjid Al Haram, the Masjid Al Haram, the place where you bow, the the, un, the place, the forbidden place where you bow, is what the Masjid Al Haram is. So it, that yeah. could be anywhere. That's not a location. It's really a function. It is what you do. Yeah. It is the place where you bow towards, the forbidden place, the holy place that you bow towards." Uh, when you go up, I just we just went up on online to find out the the, the etymological understanding of Mecca. If you go to any dictionary, they'll say the holy city of Islam. 
Again, that's yeah. the only narrative. That's the only default that you come to whenever you hear the word Mecca. It's the holy city of Islam because nobody has asked the question you're asking, Mel. And that's what yeah. I love about what you do. You're asking beyond that. You're saying, no, 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 hold on. And let's go back to the historical question. Now, you've got a PowerPoint that you're going to uh, introduce us to. And it's yeah. fascinating where you think the original Mecca is. So as you're bringing that PowerPoint up, those of you who know what Mel likes to do, he likes to delve in. He Remember, this is a white paper. This is just a what if scenario. And he is now going back and he's saying, let's do take this seriously. Let's, let's see if that original Mecca, there was an original place. Let's see exactly where that is located. And let's let the evidence dictate where we go. So let's see where the evidence dictates where we go. Mel, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to take some notes here. And as you're talking, I'm going to try to see if I can follow what you're saying and see if we can come to conclusions and see if I come to the same conclusions you come to. Okay, so where was the location of Mecca according to the early sources? So if we just trust the early sources, we come to a particular conclusion, which will be surprising, I'm sure, to 99% of our audience. Um, a few days ago, I asked my viewers on Sneakers Corner the following question, where do you think the first Mecca was? And this was in preparation for this talk with you. And it was interesting that if you look way down there, um, Mecca in the Hejaz was almost the bottom of, of the choice. It's only 5%. So 95% of the audience out of an audience of 304 votes thought that Mecca of the Hejaz was the real place where it all started. And that's okay, now, significant. I, I like this. This is exciting. What this is telling me. Now, I cannot say who all your uh, viewers are. We, I don't know if you can, are able to go into that, Mel. Can you, do, you, do you know what, well, where your viewers come from or what kind, if they are Muslim or non-Muslim? Yeah, I did a survey actually just about three or four weeks ago and I asked everyone what their religious background was to find out just the profile of my audience. And 5% of my audience were Muslim. <laughs> so so the very five percent you have here are probably all the ones yeah. that actually put in there that they they yeah. believe it was Mecca. Now, if that is yeah. the case, then look at fifty nine percent say Petra. That means they are actually listening to Dan Gibson. They're looking, Absolutely. and this is the message is getting across. And if Dan, if you're watching, or those of you who follow Dan Gibson, this shows and proves that the message is finally resonating, and people are finally understanding how important this question is. That's terrific. Absolutely. To me, I cited the fact that it is almost 60% now believe yep. that Mecca, the original Mecca, we're not talking about the Mecca today. We're not talking about the Mecca today. The original Mecca, remember, there's more than one Mecca. The original Mecca looks like it could be, they're saying, Petra. But you're going to give us some new material today, aren't you? Yeah. So what I'm going to suggest that with, with the exception of the Hejaz, everyone in, in a way is correct because Mecca, as, as we think of it today, is really a hodgepodge of lots of different places. And they have been conflated together in this new city of Mecca down in the Hejaz. And they've, it's basically, they've done a mambo number five, a bit of this, a bit of that. <laughs> and in the, in the growing mythology of Mecca, they have taken bits and pieces. And also what kind of fed into that was in the confusion of reading the Quran and wondering what the different references are, they just assumed, oh, it must be to do with this Mecca. May I just but say I, one more I, thing? It's yeah. fascinating that the number, the second most popular one is Hira, Kufa, because that is, can, you can attribute to you, because you're the one that's really now showing that much of everything we're looking at, when you look at the Quran, when you look at the foreign names in the Quran, when you look at all the references and the inscriptions that are all facing, are all taking us back to Hira Kufa, that area in Mesopotamia that's right there between the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers in what is today Iraq. Absolutely, yeah, there's, there's definitely an element there of the story that relates back to there. And I, I, I would put it down to the fact that I think the Quran was probably written in that area, but then there are references within the Quran to all of these other places such as Petra and Jerusalem. And that's why um, unraveling all of this has been such a difficult task for, for so many people. So to use an analogy then, if I can move on from here, Mecca is like Las Vegas. <laughs> it's a city in the desert that fuses many different places. As you can see there, uh, the Eiffel Tower is in Las Vegas. I didn't know that. I thought it was in, in France. So a, a, 
you can imagine if we were in a parallel universe and we believe that the Eiffel Tower was originally uh, from Las Vegas. It, essentially, that's what we're dealing with when we're talking about the new Mecca of the Hejaz, where lots of ideas from these other locations were merged together. And that's essentially the conclusion I have drawn based on the earliest evidence. So the key thing I'd like our viewers to, to kind of grapple with is that we are dealing with associations and we need to uncouple the eighth and ninth century associations that we're all um, conscious of. We assume based on sources from the late eighth century onwards that Mecca is synonymous with the Kaaba and the direction of the Qibla. But we mustn't assume it was always synonymous with these, especially as our earliest sources contradict that impression. Now, a lot of um, people, when they read these early sources, they just write them off and assume oh, they've, they've made a mistake because they are really challenging our perception about Mecca. So I would say, rather than assuming that the early sources are wrong, I think it's more logical to say, well, let's trust the early sources. It's more likely that the later sources have got the wrong end of the stick. And that's the approach I've taken. And now I'm going to be showing you the early sources and as much as possible, I've tried to avoid producing a new theory what I've tried to do is just try to understand how this could all add up. And essentially it, it's drawn from those early sources rather than me coming up with mad ideas in my head. Um, and, and perhaps the viewers will come to a similar conclusion based on the evidence I present. Now, so that ha having been said, an early source from Jacob Bishop of Edessa, 684 to 688, is a very key one. He was asked why the Jews pray facing south, to which he gave the following reply. Now, it's quite a long bit there, but he says that, for it is not to the south that the Jews pray, no, nor either do the Muslims. The Jews who live in Egypt and also the Muslims there, as I saw with my own eyes, and will now set out before you, pray to the east and still do. Both peoples, the Jews towards Jerusalem and the Muslims towards the Kaaba, Notice that he doesn't say the city of Mecca, he just says the Kaaba. And then he says, and those Jews who are to the south of Jerusalem pray to the north, and those in the land of Babel, in Hira, and in Basra pray to the west. And also the Muslims who are, who are there pray to the west towards the Kaaba. So from all this that has been said, it is clear that it is not to the south of the Jews and Muslims here in the regions of Syria pray, but towards Jerusalem or the Kaaba, the patriarchal places of their races. Okay, now if we look at a map, we can see what he is talking about. So as you can see over in, in Cairo there, in Egypt, he's saying that the Muslims there, and he witnessed this in the 680s, they were praying to the east. He also said that those Muslims who were south of Jerusalem and the Kaaba prayed to the north, as you can see with the red arrow there, and sort of to the left, sort of in the middle. Then over in Iraq, he says that the, the Muslims prayed towards the west. Um, and if you look where Syria is, he says that they prayed towards Jerusalem. The Jews prayed towards Jerusalem. And he says that the Muslims prayed towards the Kaaba. He doesn't tell us exactly where he means, but um, I've drawn this red arrow here to kind of give you an indication where it could be not assuming it's either Jerusalem or Petra. So I'm leaving that open can to- Can I interrupt here? Can I interject yeah. something here? This is fascinating because I used this very quote way back in 1998. In 1998, I was doing a debate with Abdul Green out of London, who was a head of, uh, well, at that time, he was a new convert. He was a, one of the up and rise, coming rising stars. He used to come down to Speaker's Corner. In the middle of the debate, I introduced this quote, and I, and I just as you have done, and I said, and I put up a map and I said, if what that means that they were praying towards Jerusalem, as Jacob of Odessa said, they're praying towards Jerusalem uh, from Cairo and the, they're praying east and from Iraq, they're praying west. He got up there in the Q&A and he started laughing at me. He says, you have no idea what you're talking about. If you look at those from Kufa and Waset, those are the two mosques because I was referring to Pervari and I was referring to Creswell. These are the two uh, scholars in 1905 who, who actually dug down to the foundations of the Waset Mosque and the Kufa 
in the Kufa Mosque. Uh, and he actually saw that their Qiblas are facing west. And he claims that, he, he, um, and then of course, that's why Jacob Edessa is, seems to be saying, uh, and I thought at that time it was 705, but as you're recorrecting me, it's 684 to 688, hugely significant. And he said, you're completely wrong because they're, if, if they're, they were three to five degrees off, so they were not praying towards Jerusalem. Now, that was 1998. This is in the last century when I did my debate. I didn't have Dan Gibson at that time. I didn't know that actually of the green was correct. These are three to five degrees off. And if I had known it at that time, I could have had a quick comeback say, well, then if we're looking at three to five degrees, and I notice you have it on your map, these are not, these are not really facing Jerusalem, are they? They're facing actually south of Jerusalem. And if you take a look and see what Dan Gibson has found, they're actually facing exactly towards Petra, which is sad, fascinating to me. So anyhow, that's a little bit of a historical note that happened in 1998. So we're talking the last century. Uh, we're talking about 22 years ago. You're now supporting now and bringing us to a category that we can now um, uh, be much more knowledgeable of. Yeah, I just note uh, at the top of the map there, if you see that little orange arrow, it's pointing to a Turkish town called Şanlıurfa. Now that was originally the location of Edessa. And as we'll see later, I'm going to be talking about it. it's been possibly the location at Ur as well. But we'll come back to that later. And when you say Ur, you're talking about Ur the Chaldees. You're talking about the place where Abraham comes from. Yep. So things to notice. Jacob of Dessa makes a distinction between Jerusalem and the Kaaba. He doesn't say the same place. So that's interesting. The pair terms jar a bit grammatically. As one is a city, the other is a building. Why doesn't he name the city where the Kaaba is in? Is he confused about it? Are there more than one Kaaba? It's not clear. And why wasn't its town location mentioned, i.e., why doesn't he mention Mecca? He, he, every opportunity, as you, can so, if you saw in that paragraph, every opportunity where he could have said Mecca, he doesn't. That's peculiar. Um, now, considering how close he was, like he's, he's in Edessa, he could have easily have known exactly where it was. He could have said it was Jerusalem. He could have said it was Petra. Um, but he doesn't. It's interesting. Um, he, the author, I'm going to suggest, living in Edessa, would definitely have known where Mecca is, as we shall see later. And he noticeably doesn't mention Mecca in relation to the Qibla or the Kaaba. And why is that? That's the question that, that I raised my, with myself when I read that quotation. We've often been told that Mecca was the place where the Qibla was and where the Kaaba was. This is something that nearly everyone assumes because of all of the history that has happened since then. But uh, if, we, if we think about it, he's pointing to an area somewhere like Petra or possibly Jerusalem. But as we'll see later, Mecca is in a different location to that, which means that these were two separate concepts originally. This is something I'm going to be arguing. Now, you, you will have noticed that in that previous map, Ur was located way up in the north. But did they think Ur was here in the 8th century? So you see this map here, you see Ur as it's currently believed to be. Rightly or wrongly, this wasn't where people thought Ur was in the 8th century. It was due to excavations carried out in 1853 by the British dip diplomat J.E. Taylor that the current location of Ur was determined. However, in the 8th century, it was believed to be at the same location as Edessa. Some of our Turkish viewers have pointed out that there's a local tradition that says that Ur was actually in the, the location of Şanlıurfa, which is the same as Edessa. This is fascinating what you're saying, because I, I even when I saw this, when you put this up there, I said, hold on a minute. I, I've never heard anybody say that it's up in Edessa. I've always heard that Ur of the, Cal or Ur of the Chaldees. I've always heard that together. And the reason why is, you're right, it is Taylor who, who is the first to come up across, but he's not the famous one. The name that everybody knows is Sir Leonard Woods, Woolsey. And it was Sir Leonard Woolsey who in the 19, early 1900s went back and uncovered this enormous ziggurat uh, that's still there today. You can climb up it. Uh, and uncovered the sands and found all these artifacts that were there from Ur. So that today, all of us know that Ur, and that's, I'm glad you make that distinction. In the 8th century, they wouldn't have known about this because this was not really discovered until the 1800. We're talking about a thousand years later. And I suppose the key point here isn't 
where the correct Ur was. It's what people in the 8th century thought was where Ur was. That's the key point. Okay, so a little bit more on that. Shen Lurfa is the modern name for Edessa. Islamic tradition holds that the site of Abraham's birth is a cave situated near the center of Shen Lurfa. The Halil Ur Rahman Mosque lies in the vicinity of the cave and tourists nowadays, if they go there, will be told by the tour guides that very thing. Some consider San Lurfa to be the real location of Ur, though I think the consensus nowadays is that Ur was way down in southern Mesopotamia. Now, in relation to that then, Tom Holland, based on Patricia Crona's research, says the following in his book, In the Shadow of the Sword. He says, the first direct reference to Mecca in external literature occurs in 741 in the Byzantine Arab Chronicle, though here the author places it in Mesopotamia rather than the Hejaz. So Mesopotamia once again shows up as being connected with the origins of Islam. Do you want to say anything yeah, about this, that? In... This is hugely important. And I think this is probably one of the most, this is the thing that most people have not understood uh, concerning Mecca. I remember way back in 1995 when I did my very first debate, I was uh, challenged to do this debate with Dr. Jamal Badawi, uh, who had done a series of 300 videos on Islam, early Islam, and on the Quran, specifically on where the Quran was written and all the rest. And so he had come, he was flying back from Malaysia, and his, his disciples asked me to do this debate with him on why I don't believe that the, the Quran is historical. So we're talking about 25 years ago, and I went up to Dr. Patricia Corona, went to her office. She was in Cambridge University at that time. Uh, I, and I spent the whole afternoon with her and she gave me 10 historical challenges. And one of them was this one right here. And she said, you know, Jay, the probably the most difficult ones for Muslims, and they will not know this, this will be the first time they hear it, is where is any reference to Mecca in any historical documentation? And she says, for my research, and remember, she reads and writes 15 languages. So she's able to go right back to the original text. She said, for my research, I cannot find any reference to Mecca at all. I can't find it in any Akkadian documents or Aramaic documents. I can't find it in any Arabic documents, any Syriac documents. She knew all these languages. I couldn't believe the ability of this woman. And that's why she was so dangerous. And she says, the first reference that I could find was 741 that you're referring to right here in the, continu uh, the Byzantia Continuato um, Arabica, which is a document, as you're saying, that, uh, that, that puts it into the mid 8th century, 741. That's over 100 years after Muhammad. And she said, put this into your debate and see if he can come up with any response. Now, I did this in 1995. I put that into my debate. We're now at 25 years later. Nobody has been able to dispute that point. If this is the first reference on any documentation, can you find any documentation that precedes 741? And I say this to Muslims today. Patricia Crone noticed this when she wrote, and she wrote this in, in, in her book, uh, Meccan Trade and the Rise of Islam, uh, 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 in 1987, I think is when she published it. Yeah. So we're talking about the last century she knew about this. Okay, we're, not to, we're talking about long ago she knew about this and made this up. If there's no reference to this city until 741, and then she went on and says, you won't find it on any maps until 900 AD. That's the 10th century. So yeah. I could believe this when I heard it. And I remember uh, Dr. John Badawi did not know how to respond. He refused to respond to this. I, we put that up there on, on the, our Fander website back in 1985. We, we actually, we created the Fander website for that debate. And we put that whole debate up there. And I had this question up there. It's still up there. It has not been answered 25 years later. No Muslim has found a reference for the Mecca, the word Mecca, the city called Mecca prior to 741. And we're still putting that challenge up there. Remember, why is that significant? And she told me, remember what Muslims say about Mecca. This is where Adam and Eve came to when they were thrown out of the Garden of Eden. It's referred there in chapter 7, verse 24. When they were thrown out of the Garden of Eden, which is up in space, they're thrown down to earth, they were thrown to Mecca. Well, actually, according to the traditions, what we now know that uh, Eve was thrown to Mecca and Adam was thrown uh, down uh, South uh, South India. And he had to stride across all the way from South India to join his wife up there in Mecca. I, he had to be, must have been thousands of feet high to be able to stride across that quickly. Nonetheless, that's from the traditions. But what's more important, in if you go to chapter 21 of the Quran, in, in verse 70, 51 to 71, you have Abraham placed in Mecca, and he goes into the Kaaba and destroys the idols there, and then is thrown into a fiery pit. That's in chapter 21, verses 51 to 71. So you have both those references, though it doesn't say Mecca, in the text. 
every Muslim believes it's Mecca, and that's why they put it in parentheses and uh, that this is Mecca. So if that is the case, all Muslims all over the world for what, 13, 1400 years have believed that it was that place that Abraham went to, it was that, or lived in, it was that place that Adam and Eve went to. And, and then we have the trade route theory that in the 19, early 1900s where uh, Dr. Montgomery Watt gives us this, the whole category of how is it we know that Mecca was important is because Previous to the seventh century, all the trade used to come across from China and India, across the Arabian Sea, up through the Persian Gulf, and then go across what is today uh, northern part of Iraq, across Syria, over into the Mediterranean world. And that was the trade was there until you had these battles in the fifth and sixth century between the Sassanians and the Byzantines, which shut down that trade route. And they had to be redirected from over here, from uh, Indian uh, west coast of India. They had to come across the Arabian Sea. And according to Montgomery Walk, they undid uh, all their goods there in Aden. And they went from Aden through Nazareth, Asana, up to Taif, down to Mecca, up to Yathrib. It was called Medina at that time, Yathrib, Tabuk, Khabar, and then up to uh, Gaza in the north. That was the trade route theory. So he introduced the trade route theory. And of course, all everybody applauded and all the Muslims are still applauding, say, ah, so that's why Mecca became important. Until Patricia Corona looked at that same map, part of you, look at the map here, and you can see there's a problem. Any of you can see the problem because there is a waterway. Can you see the waterway that goes up the, 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 the Red Sea, that goes right up there next to between Africa and between Arabia? Why in the world would they take all the goods off there in, uh, in yeah, Aden and go to a place called Mecca, which is not even on the trade route. And Patricia Corona noticed this. It's not even on the trade route. It's a thousand meters off the trade route. From Taif, you go down to Mecca, and then you have to come back up to get to the up route. How is it no one noticed this before? She was the first to notice this, and that's why she introduced this in her book in, trade, in the trade route theory or the Meccan trade and the rise of Islam in 1987. By just pointing out that one point, now remember, she also was able to go and look at all the documentation about the trade in that period, and she knows that all the trade included the, uh, the Africans, which are the Eritreans, and that's why Agilis comes up over and over again, the city of Agilis from Eritrea, what's today Eritrea. No reference to any Arabs were part of this trade which means Mecca would have nothing to do with this trade. And that's why it was fascinating. She just used historical evidence like you're doing now. She just went back and looked at the historical record. So okay. when you look at the map, you can see, when you look at the map, you can see it is very important that you follow what is happening in the seventh century. Don't follow what the traditions say. It's so good that she was able to do that. So 741, if this is the first reference, Mel, to the, refer uh, the, for to the city called Mecca, it supports to me, that's astonishing that Muslims didn't know about this or haven't yet been able to respond to this. Because to me, this is one of the most devastating uh, pieces of evidence that has been found, in, at least in my lifetime, concerning the difficulties with not only Mecca, but also with the whole geographical difficulties within the Quran itself. Yeah. So I think the key thing here is this, again, is an external observer. You know, you know, in previous videos, I've used Chinese evidence, but this time I'm using um, a source that was written way over in Spain, in Umayyad, Spain, from the time. So it's very independent, but the person who wrote this clearly knew what they were talking about because it is incredibly precise, as I'm going to show you now. So I'm, I'm going to use the, 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 the names of people as you would know them, but you, the original... Um, has got a Latin version of the name. So Abdul al-Malik, assuming the apex of his kingdom, ruled for 20 years. In the first year of his rule, he directed all the experience and virtue of the mind of his army against Abdullah al-Zubair, whom his father had attacked so many times in various wars, all the way finally to Mecca, as they consider it the home of Abraham, which lies in the desert between Ur of the Chaldeans and Kara, the city of Mesopotamia. Now, formerly, I, I thought that this Ur was the Ur way down in southern Iraq, but as I discovered later, there is a, an Ur which is much closer to Kara. It's actually only 10 kilometers from Kara. So when he says here that Mecca was between Ur and Kara, we're only talking about a 10 kilometer distance, so he's been incredibly precise. And this would give me a lot of confidence that this source is very accurate and is based on reliable information. So just to give you an idea, as you can see here, if we look at the map to the right, you can see Ur, 
and underneath is Edessa. So these are the two alternative names for the same location. And then there is Kare or Kara, and its alternative name is Haran. And so this chronicle is saying that somewhere between Edessa and Kare, or Ur and uh, Kara, is Mecca. And this is believed to be Mecca as of 741. This is, just to reiterate, this is our very earliest reference to Mecca anywhere outside of Islamic sources. So this chronicle is from 741. It is talking about the recent past, but when it refers to the battle between Abdul al-Malik and al-Zubair, this chronicle says that this battle happened between Ur and Kara, which as you can see on the map there, is where Mecca is, right in the middle somewhere. We don't know exactly where, whether it was closer to Ur, whether it was closer to Haran. That's not really all that important. But the key thing is it's definitely not in the Hijaz and it's way up north. So if the 741 Chronicle is correct then, Jacob of Dessa would have definitely known where Mecca was. Do you remember I mentioned Jacob of Edessa earlier in the 680s? This Mecca was on his doorstep, known locally, it is very clear from his description that they weren't praying to Mecca, the home of Abraham, but to somewhere else, hundreds of miles southwest of there, which he calls the Kaaba. That's the key point. So we have a Mecca, which is near to Ur, and we have a Kaaba, where the Muslims in the 680s were praying towards. They were not in the same location. We're talking about two separate places. So this is a bit of a bombshell. This idea that Mecca is the same place as where the Kaaba was, well, we don't see it here in the source. So it must be either a later invention or confusion or a conflation, however you might want to term it. But as you can see, if we look at those earliest sources, we're not seeing a connection between those two places. Now, you could respond and say, well, actually, these sources are wrong and they've made a mistake. But I think it's more likely they, they got their facts correct, it's actually the later uh, writers who are getting their facts wrong. And perhaps this suited them to get their facts wrong because as we can see later, the Abbasids built a new Mecca way down in the Hejaz in the 850s. And so it suited them to have everything all packaged up in this one location of Mecca. So you have the Kaaba, you have the Qibla pointed towards it. It's connected to Abraham. But as, as we can see from these early sources, the, these associations aren't there in the early sources. These are distinct separate places. When we look um, pre, to, pre to the seven, sorry, the 850s. So if we look in the 740s, or if we go back to the 680s, we don't see all of these things happening in the same place. It's a separate location. And so that's, this is a huge bombshell for, for our viewers, I'm sure. Okay. So, as, as we look again to this map, um, we can see Ur way up in the north where Mecca is. And we see that the 680s uh, chronicle points to the Muslims praying in that, inside that circle or praying towards an area inside that circle, probably Petra, possibly Jerusalem. The key thing, it's not towards the Mecca as we know it. Okay. Now, when they relocated the Kaaba further south in the new Mecca, they built it south of the old Kaaba. So if we follow the arrow way down, we actually hit upon the new Mecca, and that's interesting. So in this inscription from 697 to 698, um, it says the following. This was written in the year the Masjid al-Haram was built in the 78th year. If we can assume that this inscription, which is located 75 kilometers from Mecca, on the route to Taif refers to the site of Mecca in the Hejaz, then this would be interesting as it directly uh, is due south of the old Mecca in Mesopotamia. So just, let's look at it on a map. Now, if you remember back to an earlier video, um, I mentioned that the Nestorians prayed to the east, the Abrahamists prayed to the west um, in terms of Iraq, and the Mandaics prayed 
due south. So if we join that up to this, if we imagine the Mandakes are located now in the old Mecca and they like to pray south, then it makes perfect sense for them to move everything due south to the current location of Mecca in the Hejaz. So they're, they're moving the location with the name Mecca and what they're now doing is they're combining the Kaaba and the Qibla together with this new location. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is fascinating what you're bringing out. This is good because now I see on the map, I see where you're going with this. And we have talked about the fact that the Mandaics are the ones, you've said this in a previous episodes where we talked about the influence they had, they, their Aramaic influence on the Quran itself. And if they are the ones that are, that are really responsible, if the Abbasids, remember the Abbasids take over in 749 to 750. So they are the ones that are now have this, have this agenda. And this agenda is to create a new, a new Kaaba, a, a new Mecca that has, that is in contradistinction to the Umayyads who they hate. And so now they're, where are they going to put it? Well, they're going to put it directly south, as you see on the map there. That's fascinating because that all connects the dots for me. Great stuff. Yeah. So the Mandakes, just to, to, to reiterate, they came from that area. If you look in, in Iraq, the, the southeast of Iraq, where, as you can see, where Kuwait is, they, they were in that area. Some of the Mandakes were in Iraq. Some of them were in Persia. They kind of, um, they crossed over between those two areas. Um, I originally thought that they were just in the Persian side, but I later discovered that they're also at that time in the Iraq side as well. So that's, that was the, the source of the power at that time. This is where a lot of the key figures came from. And that's why I believe they chose that location way down south. Now, what's also interesting is the Umayyad Paz was built close to the old Mecca as well in Haran. And that has a lot of significance. The palace of Caliph Mirwan II, 744 to 750, was built on the ruins of an ancient temple of the moon god Sen in the city of Haran, a few miles from Mecca. And so if you can imagine at that stage, the, the Caliph was in Haran, and if the, the Masjid al-Haran had already been built in the, in the 690s, way down in what is now Mecca, then it would make perfect sense that they're located there and they're praying south. And uh, this probably would have created a tension because now where do they pray to? Do they pray to Jerusalem? Do they pray to Petra? Or do they pay, pray to this new location in Mecca? Now this would have created a lot of uh, conflict, as we can see in the archaeology. Some people continue to pray towards Petra. Some started praying towards this new location. Obviously, the Abbasids were encouraging people to pray to this new location, but there was a kind of resistance to this idea because people on the ground knew of what happened previous to this, which was that people prayed to the old Qibla. Can I, can I just interject there? Because you're, you're actually supporting, supporting an awful lot of what Dan Gibson is saying. Uh, if you go back to the last slide, or no, yes, you, you have it here. Yeah. Uh, if, because he, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with Dan Gibson's theory. He says that this is really a political, this is a, a, a political uh, tussle between these two kingdoms. You have two empires, not really kingdoms, but empires. The Umayyads were diminishing in authority as the Abbasids were uh, growing in authority. And so you have a real battle going on and that's why he talks about the four Qiblas. And if you look at the two that are not towards Petra or Mecca, and then one is called the Wasif or the in-between Qibla from Al-Hajjaj, and the other ones are from North Africa and Spain that are playing straight south in a parallel line between Petra and Mecca. Those were, they were holding the off and in, 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 in taking a choice. They were holding off in where to really do their Qiblas. They didn't want to go to Mecca because uh, that would be, aligning themselves too quickly with the Abbasids, who were the emerging power, and they didn't want to go back to go uh, to Petra because that would align themselves align themselves with the Umayyads, who were diminishing in power. So they're waiting to see who's going to win this battle. And if you've been waiting to see who's going to win this battle, you will have yours uh, plated, uh, uh, pointing to a place that was neither either of those two areas, which just seems to be supporting what you're saying here, because they th this would this would not have the, the in impetus to now place all of your Qiblas towards Mecca would have only really come into play after 749 or 750, when, of course, the Abbasids finally take over. They then went out. And from that time on, there's still a few holdouts. There's still a few holdouts, but almost all the mosques then start to face 
towards Mecca. Absolutely. Now, so at some point, the Abbasids decided to rename the location of the Masjid al-Haram in the Hijaz as Mecca after they took over from the last Umayyad Caliph, Merwan II. And this allowed them to fuse all the concepts associated with Mecca, including the Qibla, the Kaaba, and many other ideas which you find in the Quran. Now, so just thinking about it and thinking about the series of events, so we have 684 to 688. A Kaaba is referred to that appears to be in either Petra or Jerusalem. 697, there's a rock inscription which says this was written in the year the Masjid al-Haram was built in the 78th year. The location of this inscription is Huma al-Numur near Taif, Saudi Arabia. Notice it doesn't call it the Kaaba or Mecca. It just simply calls this place the Masjid al-Haram. And for those who want to understand, Masjid, as we said earlier, means the place where you bow your head, the forbidden place where you bow your head towards. Yeah. Now, interestingly, the Islamic Awareness website says Al-Masjid <laughs> al-Haram is mentioned 15 times in seven surahs of the Quran, and it is intimately connected with the city of Mecca. <laughs> But I dispute that. <laughs> I would I, say again, that this is for those who don't an know it, assessment. And an Islamic awareness website was a website that was created at Cambridge University primarily because of what we were doing in the, uh, the 1990s, uh, from what I understand, to confront what we were uh, bringing to forth through the forum back in the, the last century uh, by a guy named Saifullah. And he created this website to pr give the Islamic agenda. And so everything you're going to see on Islamic website is... Islamic awareness website is to support the traditions of the 9th and 10th century. And that's why even in this case here, uh, where you talk about this rock inscription, if you notice in the rock inscription, they have a, there is a debate as to whether or not the word is built or rebuilt. I don't know if you yes. come across that. And the Islamic awareness website takes one category uh, side of it, but you can see it, it is just as easily you can do with, uh, with the other. So they have an agenda here. And in your case, this is an anachronistic yes. assessment. They have to yeah. remain true to their traditions. Absolutely. Now, the, the inscription itself simply just says built, but they have uh, added a note in case people might start asking questions about this. They have included actually what it really meant was rebuilt, but that's not what it says. So that's the plain reading is Arabic. different. <laughs> yeah. so, so, however, in the 741 Chronicle, Mecca is referred to as between Ur and Kara in northern Mesopotamia. So you can see that there's there's lots of conflicts between all of these pieces of data. So how do we account for all of this? So um, I want to refer to the fantastic work by a guy called Paul Ellis, who was a guest on my uh, channel there a few weeks ago. Um, his evidence suggests that the al Majid al-Haram referred to in the Quran is theologically tied to Jerusalem. And he gives a very strong case for that. And if any of you are interested, just go to um, my channel and you can have a look. And uh, I think you'll be very much convinced that that was originally the case. Distinct from this then, the Kaaba may be located in either Jerusalem or Petra. I'm leaving that question open. Jacob of Edessa refers to this as where Muslims pray towards in the 680s. Then we have the 697 inscription near Taif, uh, which indicates the building of Al-Masjid Al-Haram. We may assume that this is in the local area so in the place that later became known as Mecca, Hijaz, you know, it has this inscription, but it wasn't yet called Mecca. And that's why it doesn't refer to Mecca yet on that inscription. In 741, Mecca was still referred to as just outside Ur. So everything fits so far. But the key point is in 754, well into the Abbasid era, or at least a few years into the Abbasid era, the Masjid al-Haram, the Kaaba, the Qibla direction, and Mecca all became fused or conflated together at the site of the Mecca of the Hijaz. This was under the direction of al-Mansur, 754 to 775, who set about a major program of construction in that location in that year. So that's the key year. 754 is when the new Mecca really took off. There was probably almost nothing there prior to that, but they, they, they put all their energies into creating this um, Las Vegas in the desert of uh, Arabia. Now, 
In a previous video, you, you may remember that I referred to these locations, which are, I, I would argue, the locations where there's debate going on in the Quran between the Jews, the Christians, the Abrahamists, and so forth, and even the Mandaics, the Sabians. Um, and these, I would suggest, also influence the mythology for the later Mecca in the Hejaz. So bringing it all together then, I believe there was a Mecca confusion, pardon the pun. Um, so we have Jerusalem, which is referred to in the Quran, and, and as, as Paul Ellis pointed out, there's lots of theological references to Jerusalem. Um, it's referred to as the house in Surah 2, 196, Masjid al-Haram and Qibla, Surah 2, 144, the Station of Abraham, Surah 2, 125, the Sacred House again, in Surah 597, and the Kaaba, Surah 595. So these are all theological references. I'm only giving you a sample of the case that he met. And then if we take in the work of Dan Gibson, he had, who's done fine work on this, he points out a lot of the geographical descriptions match Petra. So you have the people of Hijr, Surah 15, 81 to 85, um, he also refers to the people of Ad, 765 and 74. Talmud, or, sorry, Tamud. The people of Ad would be the people of Uz in the Bible. The people of Tamud would be the Nabataeans. Yep. And then there's a clear reference to the old name for Petra, which is Rakim, which is referred in Surah 18.9. And if we go outside the Quran then to um, later Hadiths, there's continued reference to Petra there. Um, there's reference to the Taniyas, which are those um, grooves into the, the mountains. They're the kind of like the, um, how, what would we say? I think they're called well, Sikhs. They're like, currently. Yeah, they're, they're called Sikhs. And they, these are just corridors, you might say, with tall, tall uh, uh, rock precipices that go right up. And you go right through and they're very, very narrow. And that's exactly what you see in Petra. Yeah, so Taniyas. this is, ref these are referred to in Al-Bukhari uh, 2645. Um, he also refers to things like loamy soil, olive trees, etc. Which, which right there, right there, right there, you can see there's a problem. How can you have slow, loamy soil and how can you have olive trees in Mecca? There is no olive trees at all in Arabia. They are all around the Mediterranean. You have to be close to the Mediterranean. That's the only place olive trees are grown. 600 miles further north. Well, you, uh, to, to refer back to what I said earlier, this is Sambo number five. We're getting a little bit of Jerusalem. We're getting a little bit of Petra. We're also getting a little bit of Pompidou, Shahira, and Mahosa because of the debates between these Abrahamist Jews, Christians, and Mandakes, as you can see there. So you can see how that's, that's entering the, the common mythology of this Mecca. And then you have Abraham's home place, which is the Mecca, which is just outside of Ur. So that's coming into it. Um, I have also included another possibility, which is uh, Maidain Sali, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, that could also be an alternative location for the Hijr referred to in sort of 15, 81 to 85. So my sort of idea is that essentially they built this new city of Mecca. And then from then onwards, all of these references in the Quran and in the Hadiths were all assumed to be about this new place. But as you know, any person who actually examines these references, they clearly can see that there's references to Petra, not to the new Mecca. There's references to Jerusalem. And also, as I've pointed out recently, Pompadita and Hera and Mahosa are clearly being referred to. The mystery deepens. I would suggest that this is all evidence for a conflation of myths. It would seem that originally the Qibla wasn't pointed towards even the old Mecca, but somewhere else such as either Jerusalem or Petra. Later, the new Mecca under the Abbasids became the focus of the Qibla. A mythology soon built around this location and the past was soon forgotten. If you imagine that in the, in the 750s, the new Mecca was being built and then a decade later, the Sarah is being written, which basically covers up all of these holes in the narrative and tells a very convincing story um, a backstory, if you like, of this new Mecca, which supposedly was built at the time of Abraham originally. And uh, the problem is the 
a lot of this evidence was still remembered amongst local communities who retain knowledge of the true alternative past. And this is the bit that is emerging, such as the fact that even today, the Turks can tell you that Ur is the, the place that is associated with Shan Lurfa in Southeast Turkey. So that's my thesis and I'll give back to you, Jay. Listen, thanks so much. This is ex excellent. What you have done again, this is one of your coup d'etats. You've just got, you brought together an awful lot of material. There, there's an awful lot here that we need to chew over. And I'm not going to do a review this time because I think you've made your case so clear. And I think this is good because this is exactly what we're looking for. We're looking and asking when you look, when you go back to the seventh century, when you go into the eighth century, when you look and see what is happening during the Umayyad Caliphate, which begins in 661, then is turned over to the Abbasids around 749, 750, and you see what was happening politically, you can then understand also why is it that they didn't have, there was no such thing in the Umayyad Caliphate of a place called Mecca. It was the Masjid al-Haram. Uh, and as you mentioned, this could be a number, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. When the Abbasids finally create their own, when they finally create their own Mecca and they actually name the place that, they added and they brought in a lot of these traditions. And that's why it's so good what you have done is unpack those traditions with us. You put it on a map, you've shown it uh, where they belong, you show even how that as you go from the different decades as you're coming down through the eighth century, you're coming into around uh, 740s and the 750s, how that then changes and you then see how the Mandaics are, for, are facing straight south. All this you put it together and it fits the pattern that we would expect it to fit from the seventh to the eighth century up into the Abbasids. And then, of course, when the Abbasids take over, they want to er eradicate anything that refers to other Meccas or other Masjid al-Harams or even anything that, even where the place of Abraham lived. And that's why you have a sublimation and eradication of all the earlier texts and also all the early inferences. But ironically, you can't get rid of everything. And that's why what you're actually coming across by looking at Jacob Odessa uh, in 680s, uh, and by looking at these inscriptions from 697, these inscriptions are, you know, you can shut people up, but you can't shut rocks up and you can't shut down the inscriptions. And that's why when you well, look actually, and see what they're, go ahead. I, I would point out that, that they did try to shut that rock up because that rock no longer exists. It was destroyed mysteriously. Ah, okay. Uh, but pictures are still there and even Islamic Awareness yeah. website has that inscription on it. <laughs> and that's why we need to make sure that we preserve this. We need to make sure that we go back to the historical context. We need to make sure that we read the rocks in their location and in their time period and not try to impose, as Islam has done, a whole new narrative. A narrative not based on history, a narrative not based on the rocks, which if we don't cry out, they will cry out for us. A narrative based on their need to create Mecca as the place uh, not only of Abraham, that is the place not only of Adam and Eve, also as the place of their Muhammad. Thanks so much. This is excellent. You've done another great talk. I'm sure this is going to bring up an awful lot of people who are going to respond to this and certainly do do that. You have the comment section below. Uh, uh, Mel is going to be looking at it. He's going to make sure that he responds as best you can. We may have to put together a Q&A period where we'll respond to those questions. Do that. Mel, this has been great having you on board. Great to have it. yet another rock unturned and another map, a whole other map that we can look at that gives us a lot of clues as to what was really going on. God bless you. Thanks for coming. For the rest Jay, of you, it's been a pleasure. This is Mel and Jay over and out.